So I actually do, I think, um, address the canvases, which turn into canvi, weird, um, as a painting. <laughs> so you're, you're blocking in your canvi, right? Justin Harder is a designer and illustrator based in Los Angeles who's been cranking out insanely good style frames for about two decades. He's worked on projects like Deadpool, Thor 2, Saturday Night Live. He's worked with huge brands and he is prolific. The dude cranks out designs at a pace that is hard to believe. In this interview, we talk about how Justin works so darn fast, his philosophy on how to design really good style frames, general career advice, and if you stick around until the end, we even dive into some of his boards to discuss discuss specific challenges that they required him to solve, techniques, and more. Let's dive in. Justin Harder, it is awesome to have you on the podcast. Thank you so much, dude. Thank you for having me, Joey. Uh, this is totally rad to be on School of Motion. Wow! This is big time. <laughs> I know. I did tell you to hype it up right before. I was like, make sure you point out what an honor this is. So I appreciate it. It is an that. honor. I love talking yeah. about motion with people. This is ridiculous how cool this is. I'm really psyched. Okay, well, let me start with something that you told us when we did our little pre-interview questionnaire. We asked you what was one of the best moves you've ever made or what's some advice you'd give people. And I think what you said was that moving to Los Angeles to freelance was one of the best career moves you've ever made, and I'm curious why you say that. Well, I was working full-time in Dallas at the time from 2000, right after graduation, to about 2010, about seven years of full-time work, and I think that anybody out there that has worked full-time, you kind of feel when there's a ceiling at the place you're working at, and I, and I felt it, and I go, I've done what I wanted to do when I got out of school, which was to, to, to get paid to draw, get paid to design, and then to work on the things that I saw on TV or in the movies. And in Dallas, we weren't, we weren't landing the gigs that we wanted to land, to be honest. And I kept seeing this name pop up that would beat us. And it was brand new school. Brand new school mm -hmm. wins again. Brand new school this. PSYOP this. You know, the kind of the classic names around 2010, which are still pretty much the big hitters in the industry. But I saw the writing on the wall, and that was... If you can't beat them, join them in a way. And I just felt the opportunities would be better out there. This was at a time uh, where, I know it's kind of like far, like way removed from our memory, but when you used to go in house to freelance and say, hi, I'm the guy. And then you could hang out and you can go to the water cooler and then you can pal around and waste too much time blabbing with people. And it was like, that was the time, but I knew I needed to do that in LA. So yeah, and, and it was a big decision. It was... If I had a wife and kids at the time, it would have been a, a more difficult decision. But being just myself, we packed up the RV, and we being my dad and my little brother, and we drove west. And anyway, the first place I worked with in L.A. was brand new school. So they always had a kind of a, a special soft spot for me. Now, you mentioned that, you know, back in those days, you, you worked in-house. And so obviously moving to L.A. is necessary if you want to work in-house in an L.A. studio. But now that, you know, essentially every company on earth at the very least has some sort of hybrid option and a lot of studios have gone fully remote, um, even some big ones now are, are open to employees being completely across the country. Would you still give the same advice? Do you still think that it's important to go to a location where the work's happening or now, you know, look, we've got Zoom and we've got podcasts. Why do we need to be there in person? <sighs> That's a tough one. What what do you what are your thoughts? I I feel like it still is very very helpful, but I don't think you'll get uh, as good as you want to get as quickly as you want to level up at home by yourself. Um, I know that like art school, even sometimes people go, should I go to art school? I go, well, the reason I went to, I realize now going to art school is good for me is that you are around peers that get you better. But if I was younger, I'd want to go in. I think I'd want to go in still because. It's just, it's just it was such a creative environment for, for me at the studios that I did go into. You're right. There's something about being in person that you just cannot replicate no matter how good Zoom gets, right? Like the, being right. in the same room with multiple people, especially when you're young, and this maybe is like your first you know, foray into the, the world of like a real adult job, it's hard to replace that with a fully remote thing. And I honestly do feel for younger artists who are, you know, graduating from art schools right now or, you know, they're just getting their first jobs and it's fully remote and they're working from home. 
in an apartment that that doesn't seem ideal to me so i would probably say if someone's really motivated and they have the means and they can get to la it's going to be it's also a lot easier to relate to the people you're reaching out to if you say hey i'm in la and i'm a freelancer and i you know i just found this awesome taco place it's just easier to build a rapport that way too so even as a freelancer i think it's easier if you're there geographically not necessary but easier you make it a lot easier for people just to say come on in swing on in we'll give you a shot for this project and then the mm -hmm. other thing i didn't i didn't i didn't mention was with people's nuances in person and we're in a service industry in the commercial business i know exactly when to just zip my mouth and give them what they need and i might be like well this isn't let's save it for the next one Let's save it for the next one. If they're not going to go with it this time, let's save it for the next one. You got your concept pieces out of it. You've got great work to show out of it. Give them what they need. You, unless you go full fine art, dude. This is the business you're in. So you have to know exactly what business you're in. And I think in person, I'm a I'm a, I'm a people person in that way. I I like to ham it up. I like to feel though. I like to listen to creative directors. And back when I was full time. I would also always listen to creative directors on the phone because, boy, they could be really PC. They could really know how to tell the client what we're going to do for how much money on what timeline and how you're going to get it. And it would just be these people talking, and I would just listen from, you know, with, with my, as I was drawing on my notepad or whatever. It, they, they wanted to have the artist in the meeting just so I could hear everything, which was great. I really respect that because now if I'm, um, if I'm not in a meeting, if I'm working for a client and they come back and they just give me all the information, my, and when I say client, I mean like a studio, the Elastics and the BNSs and all this stuff. They give me the download. I only hear what they want me to hear. I don't hear mm -hmm. it from the client. I hear it from the production studio who distills it and wants Justin to do a certain thing for the most part. Now, if, if I run my own jobs, and I've run a few jobs, I did the Book of Life in 2014, the whole title sequence, we produced it, had some animators do it, Byron Slayball and Justin Demetrician do, handle it. And you go and, ha you go and uh, listen then, it's a, different, it's a different hat. It's a completely different producer's cap. It's like one of those big brims on a hat, really. It's like a big cowboy hat, mm -hmm. no longer like just a flatty hat, which I usually wear. But like, you gotta take all, everything into consideration. Hey, deadlines. Hey, money. <laughs> is this right. person is this person producing enough for the amount of money you are paying them for? Do we want to search for somebody else? Do we want to do we not want to have that 3D camera move? Is that necessary? So you start stripping things down even in my storyboards for what I know to do and what I like to do or I know would be feasible for the time, budget, all that stuff as a producer. So those things kind of kick you out of your comfort zone a little bit. So I, I, you were talking about wearing many hats and you know, uh, like early in my career, I, I had this idea that there's a, a separation between design and illustration. I thought that they were kind of two different things, but then I've met a lot of designers like you who work in the motion design field among other places. You, you know, you also do comic books among other things. But you have an illustration background. You actually went to Ringling, where I taught for a year, which is interesting, and you got an illustration major there. So but cool. you're doing typography, and there's a lot of work on your site that has no illustration in it. So I'm curious how you ended up sort of bridging that gap. Like, what, what got an illustrator into design and then into motion design? I think it started in college at Ringling, which is so cool that you, that you were there, too. I know that you're currently in Sarasota. And it's just a, such, a, such a sweet spot in my heart. Um, so I had a roommate named Mark Unger who was a designer. And I would look at what he was doing. And so I'm like, oh, that's interesting. And then they offered a class called Expressive Typography at Ringling. And it was a junior class. And uh, I was the only illustrator that took it. And it was wonderful because it opened me up to these names that I ended up idolizing and later on utilizing... Um, some of just being inspired by in my thesis, which was all fake band posters, um, which mm. was typography infused with the illustration. Because even early on, early on, I was saying, what makes me different from all these these kids leaving that can render and that can do these epic scenes and everything? I think it's it comes from the personality. If you're not using this, if you're not using your own personality, if you're if you're not using what you are given, 
then you're 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 missing out on a, a massive piece that can separate you as an individual. Easier said than done. I know it's difficult to find out what your voice is, but I saw what that designer was doing, and he loved these. He loved movie posters, and he had a couple up. He had like the Ocean's Eleven mo- uh, poster up, which was sick. Just like super silhouetted feet, and then the Eleven coming down. I'm like, that's nice. That is really nice. This is something that I could really get into. So I think that infused, and then once I did the band posters, getting used to like laying out a variety of ways to these like fake bands. So you're creating your own concept for your fake band with your typography, with your hierarchy, with how you want to handwrite things, or let's have one that looks more photoshoppy, let's have or collagey, and let's have one that looks all hand done and you scan in and da da da. Just a different time. Like motion design hadn't come out yet. This is two thousand three. Well it was mm. out and there were some big names, but I was like looking at it going, I don't animate which I know is a big aspect of what people think motion design is. Like we have to animate. You don't have to animate. You don't have to right. animate. People ask me all the time, do you, no, I don't do that. Do you do 3D? I don't do 3D. Don't need to do 3D either if you're not interested mm-hmm. in 3D. So there's things that might be preconceived notions of the motion design industry that people might not get into because they're scared of, uh, of what they think might be uh, necessary for our profession. I would say if you want to do style frames uh, for a living like I do, you got to know composition. That's, that's it. Composition, composition, composition. Yeah, I mean, I, I've met uh, quite a few designers actually that work in this industry that don't animate. And it, you know, I guess like my intuition about it is that if that's all you're going to do is do style frames, concepts, you know, boards, stuff like that, then you have to be really good at it, right? Like um, you can get away with being like a B plus designer and a B plus animator and a B plus editor. And that's kind of, that was kind of my thing when I was freelance. I wasn't like A plus at anything. Um, But the designers that I know that have been successful that like you don't animate all have to be killers. And the other thing I want to ask you about is you're not just a good designer, but you're also prolific. Like you like, you know, I've never hired you to design stuff, but the amount of work that I see you putting out on social media, on your site, you must be designing very quickly. And I'm curious how much of that do you think, you know, is responsible for like the success you've had, just the speed at which you can design. Okay. I, I got a lot quicker in 2019 when I went in house at a place called Buck. I saw they were all using artboards in Illustrator for this Google project and I go, what, what, is, what, you guys have so many frames open on your screen. I thought it was only an Illustrator thing. Anyway, I went home, I opened up Photoshop, and I found artboards, and I laid out my first artboard style frame quilt. Six frames, all blank, 19, 20, 10, 80, and it was like this. I oh, mean, I felt so good. So I could, I was filling my, my Photoshop with, Individual PSD, shrinking it down, lining up the next one, shrinking it down, lining up the next one, shrinking it. It was a mess. I painted Thor like that. Painted the end titles to Thor like that. Just to make sure that everything had uh, uh, tonally and and, and the rhythm felt right of compositionally. So like we went... If we went close up one shot, then we'd go wide the next, medium the next shot, let's go here. Just so I could see it all at one time, I had to take the bird's eye view perspective out. What artboards did was to get me that fa- the, the, a lot faster. So I do a lot of frames um, for my clients every day. I'm kind of like a short order cook. If I only have three days, I kind of want the client to look through the old Klaus studios and look through Papa's stuff and be like, boop, 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 boop. And I go, I gotcha, you know? I got gotcha. you. We're in a good place. You like this. You showed me some other reference. I love seeing reference. I love seeing reference. We don't have two months on this thing. It's not like I have three years like to come up with the look of anything. You know, we have a day. <laughs> Sometimes you have a day on a pitch, right. for sure. I want to I wanna dig in a little bit more about the speed thing. That's really interesting. And, and, and in a little bit, I want to ask you more about the artboards and the quill things. That's really fascinating. But the... Um, you know, when, when I was a uh, creative director at a studio up in Boston, and I remember this one, uh, I think it was a pitch, and we had to pitch for, was, uh, there's a chain of Italian restaurants there called Bertucci's, and uh, we were doing a commercial for them. And so we actually hired three designers to give us concepts to show the client. 
And two of them, I think they probably each had, I don't know, two or three days each. So two of them gave us, I think maybe like six to eight frames each, right? Really polished, really good. We hired this one guy named Nathaniel Howe, who now runs Nathaniel Howe Studios in Los Angeles. And I want to say he gave us like 40 or 50 frames in the same amount of time. And they were all pretty darn good. And there was a lot of variety. And, there were, and like some of them were really simple, but some of them seemed really in, intricate. And so I'm always fascinated by designers that can kind of work that way. How do you like, and maybe why don't we start, like when you sit down and you've got a blank Photoshop document, right? And, you know, someone's like, hey, we've got this job is for Nike. There's a new shoe. We want it to feel cool and hip and urban. How do you, how do you make the ideas come and so many of them? And then you make them so fast. Like, what's happening inside of your head in that moment? Okay. We, A, we need the goodies. And the goodies from the client are typefaces, imagery, color palettes, any kind of reference the creative director has for me. I need to have things ready to go if I'm going to turn that out and go to, I'll tell you right now, whenever I start a new project, I do 15 frames, three rows of five. And, and, and that's, that's, wow. that's not even uh, sometimes. And then I realize if I'm on it for a week, we got we to gotta pump the brakes a little bit. And then after the first day, I was just telling somebody this. After the first day, I'll, I'll listen, 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 listen. What are they liking? What are they liking? And then I'll attack more of like, a, like an assassin or something. In the beginning, we're hot rod car. We go out hard. We throw everything at the wall. Everything at the wall. I'm doing stuff. You just said some of my frames have like a circle, a, a, a yellow circle in, uh, in the middle of a black square. That's it. But right. what happens when I'm looking at it is that I'm selling, I don't sell one frame. I sell tone. I sell a tone from my quilt. And the quilt is all the frames when you look at them together. I think clients are extremely happy to see all the frames together and how they work. That way they just know what their spot's going to look like. You can sell them on one frame. Absolutely. You can totally sell them on one or two frames in a nice little uh, write-up from a creative director. I'm not saying that at all. Uh, and the creative director can take all my frames and only use one for all I know. you know. But I need to do them all at one time because I think we get really uh, in our own heads when we see that white canvas. And we don't, know, um, we don't know exactly what the action should be there. But if I have a loose format of, you just said Nike spot, kind of urban hip hop, kind of cool, whatever it is for like a new shoe, let's say a new Jordan. I'm already in my mind think you're formulating a visual for me. You're painting a picture. So you're helping me out a ton already. And I'm listening, listening, listening. Then I go and hit the old Pinterest or something and go like, okay, okay. And then I get away from it. Then I, I, I look at Pinterest. I look at something online, look at a book or something like that. And then I, then I, then I close it down and I get into Justin's world, which is which would be how I then take that information and use it because if I'm looking at it too closely, of course, there will be moments from there where it's a little too close to any reference. So I put it down. I look at how we're figuring out typography with to tonality and I throw in type moments that maybe the client didn't even ask for, but it helps me define tone. So one frame might just be uh, coming soon whatever it is, or let's say it's an Air Jordan 35, right? Maybe it's the XXIII or something. I'll take that XXIII. If I know that it's going to have something like that, I can make six frames out of that. Literally just the, the Roman numerals. We're talking cropping. We're talking minimalism. We're talking rep repetition. We're talking how it breaks out to the side. There's no amount of time. I mean, so that's why I like to get goodies from the client. If they have anything, I'm like, let me see what you have. Please, I, only, I don't have much time. I need to see everything. Give it to me now. So I'll have that 15 frames and I'll be zoomed out to like 20% so I see all of them and I'll just take the colors and I'll just move swatches all around. So actually, it starts out like a painting. So I actually do, I think, um, address the canvases, which turn into canvi, weird, um, as a painting. <laughs> so you're, you're blocking in your canvi, right? And... So there's like red, blue, yeah, white. Now we need black. Now we need yellow. Now we need black. Now we need white. So the whole, already right off the bat, I'm like, that has rhythm. It's not just all black background frames across the board. It's not all yellow frames across the board. We're already popping, 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 popping. So 
that's how I work in my mind. And and then you start breaking down from there. So it's like working from back to front, like a painter would block in shapes and colors, and then they would go in and put highlights at the end. So that's me putting on typography very last as you just complete the frames and you're like, boom, I think we have something. I think I'm getting sighted. So you said something I want to I want to hit on. You said, I think you said something like, I, I sell tone, right? Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because like when I've had to design like a series of frames in the past and I'm mostly an animator, I come at it thinking, what's the story I'm telling? And I'm storyboarding it as if it's a sequence of action that tells a story. I've never gone into it thinking, I just need to convey a tone. And when you said that, this light bulb kind of went off in my head and I'm like, oh my God, that seems like a much simpler thing to start with, right? So how do you look at those two tasks differently? Like, yeah, you need to find the tone and the vibe and this, these frames make you feel a certain way. But then in the end, you know, sometimes it's like, okay, well, we need to get from A to B to C and maybe we need a thread and there needs to be transitions. And so that is a, a more sort of practical problem to solve. How do you look at those two things? Because it seems like, you know, one takes a little longer than the other sometimes. I rarely ever get storyboards. Nobody gives me storyboards. Uh, I'd say 80% of the time I'm storyboard free. So I'm coming in before those moments of hitting, mm. of, of hitting that like story moment. When we, if if the, usually before if the job hits, I'll I'll have beats, but I won't have. Sometimes they'll say, "Can you do a transition?" I go, "Ugh, transitions will come. Well, transitions will happen. Let's it's the make, animator's problem, isn't it? <laughs> let's make. You're exactly right. Get somebody else to do that. Let me worry about making the most bad a kick boompa compositionally sound pieces that we can do. We can get from A to B. That's not a problem. We all know that transitions will dictate animation, will dictate the way the piece moves. But I, I, they, I don't get in the project in the middle like that. So, I mean, I'm older in the industry. I'm always one of the older guys on the phone calls for the most part. That's a freelance designer for sure. Like, you know, and so I just had the, the, the wherewithal and I go, what they're paying me for and what they've seen from my website, they know why they want to hire me. But the, the, the idea is what I feel I need to obviously always hit on the most. It can't just be jazz hands and flash in the pan. The idea needs to come with the tone. The tone and the idea to me are one the same because everyone's like, what's the concept? Um, well, you guys are telling me what the concept is unless you're coming to Klaus directly. So I'll ha if they come to me directly, then we'll work on it together and I'll work on it as a director with them. But when they come to me and they say, Here's a bunch of stuff that we like that we sold the client on. Collagey stuff, a little bit of scratchies. You love the big swoops harder. And I go, I do love the big swoops. You're absolutely correct. And we will give you swoops because swoops sell tone. A connoisseur. I like that. You know what? <laughs> and you can't hit undo. You, you, let's not try to get the right scribble. It's got to flow once. If you're hitting undo on a scribble, you may be trying to get the line weight right or so. Anyway. L let me ask you about this. So... And maybe this SNL 48 piece, th this would be a good example. Like when I look at a lot of the frames on your site, um, you know, like I I've worked with designers where there's always a concept, right? And the concept is that, you know, th we're in this world and everything's made of cardboard, or, you know, or something like that. Like there's some concrete thing. Yes. But a lot of your work, it's like there's definitely a vibe and it, it feels analog and it kind of feels a little bit throwbacky like a little bit 90s ish and it's but it's it's a much more esoteric sort of thing it's not literal and so um what direction are you getting from a client and how are you translating that into ah okay so what this needs is i need to make the photos look like they're bleach bypass and i need to have scribbles and i kind of want to do some color washes that split the face of the of the actors like how are you basically translating direction into this esoteric visual language? For this, that's a that's a great point. For this one, a lot of again, it's the casting and its direction. Um, Ryan and the team at SNL loved what Warhol did with some portraits back in the early '70s or late '60s for SNL, the classic ones with Belushi. I don't know, and I got to see some of them with Gilda Radner. The hair was all green, the lips were red, and the eyebrow. So 
that mentality but then brought into the new updated in a way where we're putting these color overlays on stuff and uh, uh, on the uh, uh, on the each of the shots here they went and shoot everything and so I got to have great pulls from this library of footage that they did of the whole stage and everything like that so we're already right off the bat we have a great direction so that one was a lot we didn't have a lot of SNL stuff there's never any time I think it was two days of design uh, I did one style, one big style in one day, and then one slightly different style the next day. But we're talking black and white footage, so it's going to be black and white footage, uh, varying degrees of like how much gray we see in them, or how much, how many times like we repeat the images. Or again, I didn't work on the, but once it goes into production on this one, they 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 took all my files and they just. They, they made it happen. So at the end of the interview, we're gonna look at a bunch of these frames and I'm, and I'm gonna drill, I'm gonna, I'm gonna grill you on some of these because I'm really curious to hear. Now, you, you've got me thinking like, this is such an opposite way of thinking about design from the way that I've been doing it. I'm, and I think part of it is I'm a, I'm a pretty literal person. And so when a shoe company comes to me, I'm thinking, okay, concepts. Well, shoes, you know, sometimes there's like laces on them. So, okay, laces, that's like a motif we could use versus the way you're talking, which okay. I, 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 it's, I don't know, it's kind of opening up dude, a lot of ideas. Dude, Joey, this, uh, yeah. is, this is actually, I just, I'm working currently with a client where the other designers are thinking very literally and putting things on cardboard and putting drop shadows underneath them as you move things into frame. Yeah. I'm, I won't do it. Won't do it can't do it I think it's because I've done it before when I was younger and it never makes me happy and it never when I'm too literal I'm going why don't we just shoot the damn thing you know let me get the cardboard out and let me put it on a table but then that's the concept is DIY shoot it from the top down and so I might not be the right person for if you're gonna go and do like I was just had to do some collage stuff and I grabbed a bunch of my, uh, and I did some digital collages, but it, I wasn't happy with it because it didn't feel, I knew that the other people that would be pitching on this would go full traditional collage and take photos of stuff and have that texture you can only get from real paint and that feel, that lighting you can only get from really a photo. And so I go, okay, and I've got so many collages. I went and grabbed my big stack. I took some photos airdropped them to myself from my iPhone and used them in these compositions and I go let's now bring the digital component in here and let me see if I can't break anything I've done in the past in this way so it can create a new look where we're utilizing both digital and traditional it's grounded into in the traditional but I'm not over here faking it with shadows or moving it on a piece of notebook paper and then like getting the shadows just right on stuff if I work too you talk about speed if I'm working too long on a frame frame sucks Frame sucks. Mm. It just is. It's 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 not what it's not what I do anymore. It's weird. It it okay, so I did this, but that's that's design, illustration. I had some stuff I did for We Are Royale for a Outriders video game where they wanted me to do a combination of Frank Miller and Mike Mignola. I'm like, yeah, sure. Just pick out the two greatest comic illustrators of all time. Let me just get on that. No in, pressure. In, in, in two days, <laughs> no press, bro. First of all, I got to dust off the old drawing. I'm like. Okay, you've been doing a lot of type, a lot of, a lot of photo stuff lately. Dust it off. It's time to draw. So first half day, I'm going, good God, I suck. What happened? What happened here? I'm doing very, everything really, really loose. And they want me to be tight. And I go, ugh. Anyway, those frames, there's a frame in my site here where that frame took me a good solid day, two days, maybe, to draw. And it's big. It's like 4K, 300 DPI. It's massive because... The brush works so differently with different uh, different sizes, as everybody knows. It's mm -hmm. in Photoshop, and so I need to have my my canvas only one. Then there's no canva, no artboards when I'm illustrating. Right. None. I will take that drawing I do and repurpose it in compositions, like some stuff I did for Little Dicky for the first season, where I took one drawing and it it was it's a bunch of different crazy collage stuff in his face and all these different like shapes made up his person and the concept there was that he's such a different person that he takes uh, he's kind of changing all the time which is a really cool concept and the um i took the one drawing and i repurposed it with six nine frames with some typography and it's all using one drawing with type and then you take moments and you go with minimalism moments for the next frame so if it's big close-up on the drawing 
Next one's gonna be typography to show the client how it can work across bumpers and things like that they might need to use. I wanna ask you about another thing that you, you said in the pre-interview questions. You said, uh, you know, I, I think the question was, what is some advice that you would give artists who look at your career and think, oh, that looks cool, I'd like to do something like that. And you said, um, learn how to take criticism, which, you know, it's, it, it sounds obvious, but I'm curious what you meant by that. We'll hear Justin's answer in one moment, but I wanted to make sure that you knew about our in-depth motion design curriculum at School of Motion. We don't just offer classes that you can take anytime. We also offer interactive guided sessions that go deep into teaching you how to use After Effects, Cinema 4D, how to animate, how to design, how to illustrate, and much more. You get to learn alongside other motion designers and you even get feedback and support from your own personal teaching assistant, a professional motion designer who is part of the School of Motion community. Find out more on our site. The link is in the description. Well, to me, it, it can put me in a real funk. If somebody gives me the old stinkeroo on a piece that I thought was pretty great, and they're like, nah, let's go this way harder. Like, I can tell it wasn't the right direction that I was going, and I, I wasted A, a day of their time, and, and they might be like, uh, we kind of spent some money on this guy for that one. It's the wrong mm -hmm. one. But you know what? You got to pull yourself up. You got to be a professional. You can't go to negative town and be like, whoa, whoa, is me. They don't like what I'm doing. They hired you. They like you. You got to get out of that artist mindset of us kind of crushing this self-defeat stuff. You're good enough to be a pro. You're good enough to be hired. You, you are good enough. I'm telling you you're right now. And so I get in that too. I'm like, oh man, just take it. You can take it. Get some thick skin. It's kind of I might be some kind of like a macho thing or something like that, but it hurts. I mean, it hurts when somebody doesn't like your work. Yeah, I mean, really, it sounds like, so it's interesting. I was, I was expecting you to talk about, you know, don't get angry when the client makes a comment that like makes the design worse and stuff like that. But really, it sounds like you're very competitive, which is, which is cool to see. Um, but really, it's like you take this, this is your professional art, right? Like I'm sure it would feel different if you were doing a piece just for yourself and some like something you want to hang on the wall and someone came over and critiqued that. Oh. But if you're doing boards for a client and they make a comment that you think objectively makes the design worse, it's their money, right? It is. And, and what we can do as professionals is to hopefully bring the horse to water and hopefully make them drink. That's what mm -hmm. you hope. And so when they see certain decisions, I can't explain it. I'm not going to sell you on it. But if you see it and it feels right to you, hopefully you'll go with it and you'll go along with us on that same ride of like, hey, we can crop typography. Hey, you know what? Maybe every frame doesn't need to be extremely legible. There might be uh, typography that's not there. You know, that's what in my tone that I sell, a lot of the times I won't just do, um, I won't just do bumpers, you know? Do the in-between bumpers. Do like where the type goes in between those moments because that sells tone. That sells cool. I like to mm. I like to really push cool and make it feel uh, of that of that something where they go, whoa, we didn't. We were just expecting to say now airing on on Peacock or something, right? But you have now like the the size of a whole screen, and you can only read the W and the O, and then the airing is like a different. Because I'm just having fun. It's just too fun. So Justin, I want to ask you about one project I saw on your portfolio, which is the logo for an upcoming um, Blade, you know, I don't know if it's a movie or a TV series, Marvel's doing it. And I thought, you know, in my mind, logo design, that is the, the world of the pentagrams, you know, and, and that's what they do. And it's kind of a separate thing. So how did you get that gig? And how do you look at logo design? Is it any different than what you normally do? Man, you, you're exactly right. It's an ad agency, big agency thing. Um, with that comes a big paycheck for those people that would do that. And what has happened in the industry is that trailer houses and production houses uh, that, that focus on trailers will be getting an opportunity to, to pitch on a, on a Marvel film, on a Disney film. And in that pitch, with their edit, they get the footage from Marvel and they are asked to put typography in there. Coming soon, this summer. And to, they don't get given, the, they're not given the logo. So what comes mm -hmm. with the package all of a sudden with motion, and that's who that blade was with, you're asked to put in your logo. And so as a designer, I don't, I don't, I didn't like it. I didn't like being asked to do a logo that would last forever for a day rate. And so I, I meant, because I just didn't feel like it was very fair, um, because I know what a logo would go for, 50K, 100K, 
a lot of a lot of development goes into logos. You know that it is. It's so many cooks to please. You got to hit different demographics. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I initially pulled back and I told Motion that I wasn't comfortable doing it, but I would do other stuff for him, the style frames or whatever. And I know it might sound a, a little hypocritical because you're over here putting a lot of logos on different shows, but usually they some. For the most part, they had they give they give you the logo. Maybe not. I don't know. But I didn't like it for Marvel. They said it was an unnamed Marvel movie, and I go, okay, those make a lot of money. I think. Yeah. And so I, you had to put on your producer hat and your kind of protective artist hat, and I said I'll do it for a flat fee. And I said I don't know how many I can give you for a flat fee. I was actually really I was I would rather be a little bit um, a little bit stubborn on this one than to be taken advantage of. I think if, if you're if you're a younger artist, you'd say whatever. I'm going to do it. I would get I would get the I would get the blade logo in my portfolio, and that's mm-hmm. that's why they can have motion do it because everybody wants to work on a Marvel film for sure. I didn't yeah. want the opportunity to go by, and um, they went with my flat fee. Is the flat fee massively nominal? No, it wasn't. But um, I I felt better. My integrity was intact. I felt. And so uh, I, I gave him one option, um, and it's not that I, I didn't have any other options in me. I, whatever, sometimes it hits where you go, this is the answer. Thank, thank God. It was just like one of those moments. I did it, and I go, this is the answer, and I sent it over, and then two days later, I heard that they chose it. And then they put it into 3D, and then it was up on screen at Comic-Con. But I only gave them awesome. one. And so they probably look at it going, wow, we gave a flat fee for one logo, but... It's like that, again, that Paula Share doc, she said, it's taken me a long time to get to that point of doing that logo right off the bat. 40 years, she designed the Citibank logo, merging with Travelers United Insurance with the little umbrella thing, and she scribbled it on a napkin at the meeting that she was being pitched on, and she said, here's your logo. And they said, that is our logo. Wow, you did it. So we don't have to pay you. And she goes, no, 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 you pay me everything. It's taken my entire life to get that quick, you know? Yeah awesome story i loved it so that's the blade story um the coolest absolute coolest they said it was going to be on uh, kevin feige's hat as he walked across the stage or something and then an unnamed actor and i thought it was going to be wesley wesley snipes coming back for it so uh yeah, when it was when it was mahershal ali and he puts the hat on with the logo it was pretty special man it's really special. It's one of those moments. He's we, a great choice for Blade too, but I mean that that is good casting too. <laughs> it's one of those moments that we think of, yeah. that we that we dream about. Those opportunities. So I didn't want the opportunity to go, and I also wanted to make sure to to feel good about it as a designer. Yeah, that's really cool, man. That's really cool. Um, all right. Well, I think now it will be fun to just take a look at some of your work and kind of talk through it. So. Let's start by talking about this project here. So look, this is for your buddies. A brand new school for a little tiny startup called Meta. And okay, I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, I wouldn't have a clue where to start. What, what did they say to you when you know they came to you with this project? Like, what was the the brief you were given? Okay, this one started with um, the the creative director liked my gestural drawings from my portfolio that were my personal drawings. So. Right there, artists out there listening, put your personal work that you feel strongly about into your portfolio and make sure that people can mm. see it because you will get asked to do it and then you're super excited, right? Because it's something you would do for free. We don't ever tell them that though. So they like the gestural stuff I had done where um, it's basically a roto look, but I'm, I'm, I'm using definite, I'm, I'm drawing on top of footage here, but I'm drawing so loosely that it feels like it might not be on top of footage, but we're using mm. poses. Um, this is the final. We had we had about two th- two days of getting to this point where I was doing more gestural, and then I noticed. I remember you asked me once about um, if I ever thought about how the animation would get get done. I was drawing these really gestural drawings, and I, and I asked the creative director, I go, "Are you guys gonna have somebody doing cell? Like this is a lot of cell work. I mean, this is like straight up like character animation, a ton. <laughs> tons of cell." Yeah. And and we both go. No, we're not good. We don't have enough time. And I go, okay, I'm, let me switch gears on you a little bit and it, do whatever you want. Do, do, you go to town. I grabbed footage of people dancing and knowing that I was like, maybe we can get footage and I, I could roto. So I, I kind of just lied to you early on. I said that I don't animate. I don't sell animation on mm-hmm. my site in terms of me doing it. I will sell production. We did Book of Life, had another people animate. 
I actually did all the animation in this spot. I rotoed, and um, they gave me the footage they bought from Getty or whatever. They cut out the clips for me, so it was like on twos or on fours, it was like you know five, six drawings a second. And and I did I did all the drawing each and every frame with the different brushes, and I made sure to, on each layer in Photoshop to to label what brush it was of Kyle's Mega Pack and try to find it again in my little thing. And I go, oh, that's not the same brush I did for the concept. Will they know? I don't know. Let's find one close enough. So a lot of those little pieces were coming together as I was doing the roto for that, and then ended up buying myself. I worked myself into a gig for another three or four weeks, which is, you know fun to do as a, as a freelancer if you go, wow, you're going to go with me for all this. And I just, a little bit more tedious than I've done in the past, which is so fast, fast, fast. What's the next project? Fast, fast, fast. This one, I got to sink in and really enjoy doing cell animation on all of these different characters. That was really, uh, that was really a wonderful spot. I want to ask you about Thank the you. color palette. So, um, you know, color is something that Almost every designer I've ever talked to says some version of like, oh, color is really hard for me. I don't consider myself good at color. You know, but I'm looking at like, as an example, this blue background here and then this red color on top. And those colors, if you didn't calibrate them just right, they would buzz, right? So how much of your use of color is intuitive to you and you just sort of picking colors till it feels right versus using like theory that you learned in school? I think the theory I learned in school has now become intuitive, if that mm. makes any sense. I think at this point, um, I, I have a certain, I love neons, and uh, arguably sometimes use them in conjunction with one another a little too much. And this one was really cool because they went with, uh, they went with everything for the most part that I was throwing up there. So luckily, the client, and it, it, this is a, such a team effort, a brand new school was loving everything I did, didn't try to direct me on, on anything, and it was one of those projects that was so quick that um, it kind of slipped through the cracks in a way. You know, you kind of get on those projects where they're like, I, I think Harder's just delivering a shot after shot, and I would just ask them for the next shot from the editor, they put it in the piece, and, and I would put these colors together, and sometimes we would have to, you exactly right, I think they did need to go back on a couple of the clashing combos there to make sure that things uh, didn't burn eyeballs or something. But, right, right. But um, yeah, I go pretty hot, and uh, I thought it would be, again, selling a tone. I think there was a fun tone, a funness to it that I think could capture an audience. Yeah, super cool, man. All right, so let's talk about this SNL 48 piece. Uh, we talked a little bit about it already, but th to me, this, I think, really feels like what you were talking about. This is a vibe. This is a tone. There's not an obvious way that this animates. There's not an obvious, you know, it's it's not even clear what order these frames would go in or how they would be used. It's really just like, do you like this? It's going to feel kind of like this. And, you know, having, having just talked about this with you for a while now, it's like, oh, I get it. Like, I don't know what use this frame here is, but it just gives me ideas as an animator. Oh, I could think of something to do with that. So maybe just tell me the story of this project. Like what, you know, you talked about it a little bit. They like these Andy Warhol paintings. But then what, like when you open Photoshop, what do you start with? Like how do you get to this? Yeah, that's, so we knew that, uh, yeah, no, some of the frames in there didn't get used or bits and pieces did get used later on. But initially you'd be like, where, how do we cut this? It's funny because Ryan McNeely that runs uh, Visual Creatures with with John Cranston, they uh, Ryan just goes. We found people that can animate Justin. This guy can. This guy, <laughs> this That's guy, great. this gal knows how to animate your stuff. And I'm like, can you give them to me? I'm running a project. I need to have somebody that can animate. Like, because I can't explain it. You're right. I don't know what to tell them. I'll say maybe it comes on and it has this thing. But it, I think the free wheeling with which I'm designing needs to apply with the animation. Like they both need to be on the same kind of like go 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 it's got to be poppy it's got to be snappy we can't go and there let's not easy ease every single piece in here but when i'm doing doing it when i'm doing these frames we knew that uh austin butler was going to host the opening uh episode so we we grabbed some photos of him i grabbed photos of him um right off the bat so we needed a title card with him um we also knew that we're going to be do doing this uh hyperlapse i believe that was called where they did like the hyperlapse of the color on 
the color being used uh, over top, overlaid, screened, or whatever it was uh, on a hyperlapse shot of like, brrr, into, like zoom into um, the plaza there, or like Studio 8H. Mm-hmm. And so there's a couple things I know how they're going to do the edit, which is helpful. Um, Color-wise, I wanted to go, and they used that one piece there of the stage, that aerial shot of the stage. I got to look through a lot of cool footage that they sent over of their their camera guy going out on whatever day it was and sending over just B-roll, just shot, just take after take of the camera zooming up to the stage, which was so awesome because as a lifelong SNL fan, I mean, I'm I'm getting to work on something that I I one time in my life I wanted to be on SNL as a as a comedian actor I wanted to be like Farley and Spade and my favorites and and Dana Carvey blah blah so I I looked at that stuff so this is a big moment for me to be attached to SNL in this way so I totally over delivered you talk about a, a quilt for that day it might have been up in the thirty five forty for a day I went wow. to town I went to town because I, I I care about it so much I love being attached to brands. In this way, you see how hyped I get about Deadpool, Thor, SNL, um, Blade. I get jacked, man. Like it's what we do. It's so much fun. It's so much fun to like to to be able to talk about SNL. It's a dream come true. It's ridiculous. It's some of the stuff uh, they carried the tone, and then they expanded on it, which I love when studios take what any of us do in a day or two, and then they have their talented artists go and put their spin on it because. The pieces just get better with collaboration. They really do. Like, the creative directors know what, I, what I'm capable of in the time. They know how long they're going to have on it. And I love to see a piece come together. We're like, oh my gosh, that looks so great. You guys crushed it. The animation is so sick. It's, it's awesome. Like, for the first weekend update, Jordan Scott animated it in like three days or something. And he's awesome. And that dude, really that good, dude's yeah. a rock star. And it was like, yeah. all my designs were complete. Every design I did was totally utilized for that opening sequence in a piece that uh, I get asked about, honestly, weekly when I design. So it's kind of a, a great little marketing piece as things go on. You want to be able to have these kind of pieces on your por- on your portfolio and your website um, that can bring in more clients and, and, and get people to talk because people get excited about the big brands that they know. Where do you get, because there's a lot of, you know, I, I assume sort of just painted in Photoshop stuff in here and there's photographs, but then there's also like these big paint strokes and then there's there's effects that almost look like light leaks, you know, like these sort of washes of light on the on you know the corner of the frame, stuff like that, these squiggles. How much of that it are you know, comes from elements that you've collected over the years? Oh. Do you have a hard drive full of stuff? Or are you trying <laughs> to make stuff, you know, as much as you can? Um Wow. Good question. I, I think all of us have our little bag of resource goodies, don't we? I got we a do. nice little folder, and I, sh- and I showed my Klaus U folks the folder, and I was like, it's called resources. You just go through file folder after file folder of, of photo, photocopy paper. Um, mostly it's, it's elements I put on top of stuff, right? Um, all, the, yeah. all the scribbles are done particular into that for that piece. Um, you see that one little light leak there on that SNL with the big crop type and the Empire State Building in the middle. There's that light leak from the left hand side. Mm-hmm. That's a that's a wonderful photocopy piece that I found, and it just has the best gradient, and it just feels. And I used it for the first time on this project, and now it's kind of slipped in a little too often. I go, I gotta get rid of that. Let's, not, <laughs> let's find a different piece. It's a crutch. Yeah, yeah it's a crutch thing. So um, I do love going to like you work for them and finding new new things, new typefaces constantly. New, um, if there are like packs or something, like for a recent project, I didn't have the time to create a bunch of bespoke um, doodads and whip-wops, I call them. A bunch of little, little, little like UI things. You got a lot like, of good words, man. I like, <laughs> I like that. And if you don't, if they bring you on for a long enough period where you can define that language together, then of course... But when I know what I want to get to, some of the things, the little X's, little circles, I'll go, I got, a, I got a pack of those and I'll use them and we can be like, okay, placeholder until we can develop that language together. But like in here, yeah, that, yeah, there's just color overlays and for, for, for the most part in all this. And um, mm-hmm. the it, it, design is as much about what you don't design as what you do. I heard that and I was always like, okay, just, just uh, can you make it, exp- can you explain that to me, please? That just broke my head. But now I realize how much, the quiet moments uh, help out my design work because a lot of stuff is so loud, but if everything's loud, 
then nothing is loud. It's like the old line from The Incredibles, if everyone's super, then no one's super. So I'll do um, loud stuff and then we gotta go minimal and quiet. In those moments, that juxtaposition and, that, and those kind of contrasts really make pieces pop for me with my most successful stuff. Love it. Right, so let's take oh, a yeah. look at yeah. these, yeah, these YouTube style frames, also brand new school. What I love about these is they couldn't be simpler. There's three colors, there's a typeface, that's it. So can you like tell me what, what you know, direction were you given? How'd you end up here? Yeah, there's not much to work with here. What, what, uh, and hopefully the concept, we did have the colors, and I don't think they ended up going with anything black. I think they wanted to stay white and red. Um, I think that was their colors, so some of the stuff was kind of done in vain. But like, for instance, the top... So I wanted to come up with three ways to, to, uh, to communicate speed with typography. And the first mm -hmm. one was a, a, a cutting way up top, those two up top. Actually, the four up top is all a cutting way and splicing of the letters. And um, using type as a design element is something that I've, I feel like has gotten me a lot of work over the years. And I still get a lot of work for typography um, that comes in. So that's a design, gra purely graphic design hat at that point. Um, and, uh, and I always find that that's one of the, the things that students definitely don't focus on in motion design uh, over motion design courses or at colleges is they don't really hit the design aspect or graphic design typography component. They kind of go to the fun stuff of the Cinema 4D and, and, and the Maya. But if you, have, if you are interested in typography, you'll clearly get better at it and be asked to use it more often in your style frames. And I get asked about it a lot now because I also sell graphic design and typography. I kind of put some of the pieces with typography up towards the top of my website nowadays to make sure that we have the, uh, the, the illustration, but a lot of type at the top of my website, which I think is important because I want to, I love typography and these ones. So then, um, so then the middle one is another concept with playing with speed as well. This was all about how, how fast the streaming was for YouTube TV, I believe. And Unlimited, I felt with Unlimited, let's go to the stretchy thing, which has kind of been a little trite. It's kind of getting towards the point of being overdone, but I thought I can take something that might be overdone and do my own spin on it where it would be new and fresh. And so actually, conceptually, it made sense to me with Unlimited being stretched, with more being stretched. I mean, it's not rocket science, but I feel like if you can connect and you can talk with about your idea for how the typography should look to your to your client, your studio, they'll be able to use that same vernacular. It actually might give them an idea to talk with their client with YouTube and say, listen, it's unlimited. It's more, let's go big with everything because that's how much encompassing your idea is. So you kind of put on different hats there. And, and, and I think they went with the splicing one at the very top, uh, but it was a little bit um, dialed, dialed back because uh, all this clearly is not really on brand for, you, for YouTube. Um, I've never let a brand book get in my way of making something that I want to make. They'll say, well, look at the brand guidelines and we can look at it on day two or day three, but let day one be, let day one be utilizing the person for why you hired them. Go to town. And sometimes you might not have the time or budget. And uh, I feel like maybe if we can get a little bit of column A, a little bit of column B and meet in the middle, it might be a fun place to be, a new place to be for the client. They might never knew that they wanted to go there. Um, you know, looking at these frames, I think, you know, doing stuff like this, this is such a great exercise if you're learning design. And the key to making it work, um, aside from, you know, like thinking in terms of like a series of frames, right? So you've got close ups and wide shots and, you know, extreme wide shots. But composition seems to be what kind of makes or breaks a design like this, right? Um, that, you know, the typeface isn't some really cool looking thing by itself you've got it you got to put the work in to, to make it work so do you have any composition tricks or strategies or philosophies that you use to do stuff like this i think it's it's sometimes easier to focus on the composition when there's less in the frame so i'm curious if you have any any tips or anything that, that helps you I, I don't like to repeat myself in in style frame making for a particular concept so if something's on on black let's make the next one in red if something has a lot of type let's make the next one a, a, a little least amount of type so those things tonally in juxtaposition of compositions really drives me to make the minimal one with the maximal one so if i go big ends on one i know the next one's got to be centered 
super mm-hmm. uh, super quiet and a bit and, and more minimal than than and then we can go with a medium shot. So really, just thinking scale scale contrast really drives a lot of it. Repetition drives a lot of it because um, I, I don't. Sometimes I think the for a lot of the work I've seen for my workshop and and younger designers they'll repeat themselves in frames. So if we're doing like a starring Matt Damon, it's going to be like almost a similar composition for starring Jessica Chastain, and then it's the similar one like let's show them this is how we show them, this is how we show them, and it's like the same exact frame over five or six frames. You already showed me how we did it once, so we have that already in the pocket. Let's go and show me something different so that that might be uh, another way to talk with the director about how we can apply type or image scale and contrast. So none of these really are repeated. If we unlimited stretched at the bottom, all those letters were very nice to stretch vertically, by the way. Um, th- there's no, there was no S's in there, which might have gotten a little bit tricky to stretch that top. Yeah. But um, you notice how I didn't stretch the top of the R? They are. I only stretch the bottom. It wouldn't work. So yeah. you do like little, little. But I knew if we did unlimited stretching vertically, we we got that one covered. Let's let's do more that go horizontal. Let's repeat some. Let's get some smaller back in space. And so each one of those four to me has a rhythm to the quilt. Um, in my own my own like world and way, and 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 hopefully the client will go there too and think it was cool. Awesome. All right. I wanted to ask you about this one because this one is very very graphic designy. You know, like there's a grid to it. And a lot of the work that you do is very illustrative and it feels like free form and you can really kind of feel the human hand in there. But this is different. This feels, uh, you know, it's it's very, in a way, Saul Bassey and I see a grid there. So uh, talk about this one. Like, what were you told by the client? Why did you choose this approach? You know, anything that you remember about this gig? Really, uh... And this one retained almost this exact same look, but it it has a bit more uh, tactile quality in the final, which which was really nice because uh, I think it needed it from these frames. But uh, there was a piece in their reference they pulled that had very mid-century modern color palette, and this is a classy show, classy late late night show. Sorry about that, late night show um, where he talks about sports and he gives his very uh, distinct opinion on on sports and humor. And if it's late night, I felt it needed to have a certain class to the design of the minimalist of the minimalist way. And I go, if I, I can't see this being any other way, but let's break down various sport fields and tropes of sports. He covers everything. He goes from basketball to soccer, football, whatever it is. So let's figure out that kind of vernacular with you know if there's stripes or if there's laces from a football. What are all the what are all the design elements I can pull in my bag of goodies? to be able to beat out a sense of tone over uh, 8, 10, 12 frames. And these were all done the first day, and they ended up making it to the final. It's crazy how sometimes the first day ones are just your initial gut response goes all the way. This also has me not repeating myself anywhere with typography. Um, I knew that Bomani loved Jordan shoes, and so I threw in the textures from Air Jordan 3s, which is that elephant cement skin on the top. And then the speckles mm-hmm. from the Air Jordan 4s uh, down there and the Bomani Jones at the bottom, um, the bottom middle one there. Um, so I'm Which utilizing one? This, some, one, this one here? Yeah. That, those oh, are, or this yeah, one? Th- both, yeah. That's, that's the cement yeah. texture or the rhino texture from the 3, 4, or the elephant skin that also is called. But anyway, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm really getting sneaker. Anyway, Bomani loved it. He's from Texas and I'm from Texas and he goes, he goes, man, you're the coolest guy coming out of the woodlands or whatever. He's from really close to where I grew up in the woodlands. It was, uh, it was pretty funny. And uh, we ultimately, I think they didn't go with any of the Jordan textures, but I had to put them in there. I think he got a big grin on his face because it's, you know, try to make it as particular as possible conceptually to the person if it is his own show. And, and you're kind of, you're, you might be hitting the right the right chord. Um, again, not, not repeating any typography. If we went with... Uh, Game theory vertical on one side with Bomani Jones in one way. Let's not do that for the next one. Let's crop the typography to show an animator how it could possibly move. And the animator took this and, and just did wonders with it. So if I find that I can't really uh, prescribe animation to an animator. I always, I always love when an animator takes my stuff and does their thing because they're pros. They're awesome. I, I, I couldn't possibly in a million years 
try to tell somebody how to animate some of the stuff I've seen them do with my stuff. I really love when somebody is so talented and so excited about animation, they just crush it. And when you talk about like people that go, I'm a designer that can animate, I don't really want that person really necessarily. I want an animator that can animate. You know, sometimes you go, well, I can do this, but I can also do this. Well, let's see what the real looks like because I can animate, but you don't want me animating. You know, right. <laughs> like I'm saying, now, there's of course instances where people are nowadays are completely bad A at both. Um, but you got to find that person that really has such a desire to animate motion design and also animate typography and animate the way this moves, which is two different things. I think I, I've probably said this a million times by now on this podcast, but you know, one of the, the things that always tripped me up was, and to this day still does, if I'm designing it as the animator, I'm already thinking ahead, ooh, that adding that extra layer, that's going to be kind of tricky to manage in After Effects. And, you know, I, I, in a way, I'm jealous of you. Like, you're kind of freer to just design whatever you want because it's someone else's problem <laughs> at the end of it. Yeah. You don't have to, you know, it's funny, like, you know, looking looking at these these little details and the way that I might have animated this, you know, having things that are in a grid, but you want the grid to expand and close, and that can be kind of tricky to do. Pretty easy to design, though, you know? Totally. I, I'm looking to make yeah. pieces that I would want to have on my wall if I, was, if I was printing stuff out, you know? Like that one, that one piece right there with the R and the Y with the home plate and the baseball and the basketball there. What, what the heck is even happening there? Are we going to have the type come in? Does it pop in? Do the things... I don't know. I don't know. We, we, we'll let, let somebody that really knows what to do put their spin on it. I want to kind of lob th something up and have somebody dunk it, you know? Like, I'm the lob... I, I feel like uh, our job as concept folks is lobbing. I go, we're, we're, we're in this together. We're th This might be me doing my thing early on, but we're in this together. Here, lob. Here, guys. T am, I, right. am I anywhere near it? I'm throwing, the, I'm throwing all the stuff I have at the wall. The cannon is getting shot at the wall. Take it. They like it. Then we can hone in. You know, we can hone in laser focus on a particular direction. So I wanted to ask you about this one for DraftKings, Justin, because it's like, okay, so there's a vibe as an animator. I'm looking at this and I'm like, this looks unbelievably cool. I'm not, I don't have a clue how I would approach animating this. Um, you know, the designer clearly wasn't thinking of, of my mental health when, <laughs> when he made this, but the the way you've stylized the football players, there's so much texture, but everything's kind of balanced. And then you've got these, you know, these really beautiful kind of quiet moments with the numbers and everything. Like, I wouldn't even know where to begin to create something like this. And like where, you know, the, the way the football players look, where did that come from? So I'm just really curious, like like in your brain where does this kind of thing live and you know does it come out like this or are you like blocking things out and then thinking nah, it's not crazy enough let me add some more paint splatter on mm. it yeah uh, hopefully all of it is done in service to the concept which is gritty in your face um football action kind of like the classic motion design uh, my take on the classic motion design type and and image with a with a different kind of flair to it hopefully had a nice color palette, usually green and oranges don't really work the best together. Um, and that was fun to figure out and a nice challenge to figure out how those do live in the same frame together or what kind of percentage is in each one. Again, starting with the artboard frame sequence, I think probably started with six, uh, three rows of six, so 18 to begin with on the day. Um, start filling it in with black and green backgrounds to start with. Gray backgrounds is another color in their, in their branding campaign they had a nice typeface i feel like it was a really uh universally accepted easy sans serif there and they had a nice uh, italic form of it and i thought that made sense of the movement of football um mm -hmm. i i really just enjoy the heck out of uh challenging myself to do something i hadn't seen before and and, and hopefully something that um i hadn't well, not that scene before, but I hadn't done before. And I think by cropping a lot of the typography here to look show stats and yardage, I feel like it kind of gave a sophistication to an otherwise spot that could maybe go too literal with some of the um, some of the copy. But those are copy points that they had in their script. Underdog, I know that I had to hit a moment there on the second day where we made him smaller to feel like he's smaller in the underdog world down there on that bottom one. 
Um, paint wise, yes, exactly. Some of those brushes I actually used in Thor The Dark World, a uh, name drop there, but I erased out of them in such a way that they've ne that, that I created new looking splatters and, and kind of grit, but I needed to have those accents and those moments to give it that, that feel. Um, I like that frame a lot there in the middle. That's kind of fun. Knowing that we're probably not going to be able to use players, actually knowing we couldn't use players because of uh, NFL um, rights thing. Mm -hmm. So you have to black and out for the concept just to show were they going to shoot it? Were they going to use stills? I don't really know. I didn't. I wasn't privy to that aspect of it. That's but awesome. again, big, again, though, thinking about scale, scale of the football players all throughout here is different. There's not one that's mm -hmm. repeated the same size. If we do close up here on the football, then we're going to do a medium shot on the next one, or we're going to do a mm -hmm. tight frame that fills in the gaps kind of things. But getting in there and actually adding highlights to the football players is using some of that illustration background you're talking about, kind of pulling different shadows and then just like replicating and duplicating and doing something, then that kind of offsetting it. So there's almost like a print technique to it, but not really like a digital print paint technique, but just kind of wanted to... to, to, to to knock you in the belly with it and so that was a fun one all right dude let's talk about the these ama boards here so i have a bunch of questions i mean th they remind me a little bit of the snl ones um you know you've got like famous people photography love it there's washes of color um but there's this weird funky distortion and a lot of texture it feels very glitchy um so what you know I guess just kind of take me through this project, but specifically what I'm interested in is like, how did you achieve these looks? You know, I mean, you're, you're, are, are you really good at Photoshop? Like, is that how are you getting these effects? I'm, I'm, uh, I'm really not good at Photoshop, to be honest okay. with you. It's <laughs> kind of like, um, okay, so I, people were doing this pixel sorting thing. And I'm like, I saw a lot of pixel sorting going on. And I'm like, I don't have, I don't have the AE plugin. I know how to open After Effects and do a few things. And I've since recently got on the Red Giant Bagwan, so I paid the mm. subscription fee on that one to make some of my frames have the chromatic aberration that is just so slick from that from that service. So anyway, and I used it on some of these frames, um, the, the aberration deal from, from After Effects. But I saw pixel sorting could be done in Photoshop, and I liked what it was doing, this like stylized wind thing, that Photoshop mm. has some really goofy things and I like to access those to use tastefully. Same thing in Illustrator. There's some, I do a lot of typography and I do it right there in the American Music Awards logo where I made that into a vector file and I brought it into Illustrator and I pulled, that's not a warp, that's not a warp tool, that's a Illustrator pulling all the points in Illustrator with some of these very strange skew and pucker and bloat and all these things right. that a lot of folks don't really go to but I've really I've harnessed some interesting aspects of these programs that we're in every day right so and always trying to find ways to do something different and, and make something new so uh, using the pixel sorting here on abstract paintings which is the background there for that one which is just me doing pink blue and some of those colors were their brand colors but some are just some of my favorite colors to to you use and I wanted to almost do something uh, oh this is the other thing I'll say if I have time to do a three concepts for my client, I'll do a mild, medium, spicy. So mm -hmm. first, first one, I actually like to go and do spicy first sometimes, which is go completely nuts. Or inversely, I'll do that last. And I'll make sure to hit the mild one that they want. I'll do mild and maybe make sure to knock that out for them. And then the next day, we'll get increasingly more and more kooky. Um, so that's kind of where it's at with, with this one too. Um, I think that starting out with, and, and the imagery, we had great looking celebrities, which anytime you put these people in your boards, it automatically makes them have such a air of authority. You put, you put Childish Gambino in there, right? And like, mm. and like Lizzo, it's like, holy moly. So it's just pairing that then with a sophisticated typeface, that, uh, a sophisticated application of type, if their typeface is not the most... Uh, wonderfully unique one in the world. I, I don't really, I love all, I, I honestly, when I get a typeface, I, I just take it as a challenge to make it, make it hot, make it hot. You know, if it's a, if it is what it is, and there was a great typeface here. So I wanted to make sure that they saw how to use it in various ways, because as I've seen these programs in the past, 
there's so many ways they cut between names and best album and it's all over the screen and it's cutting to a lower thirds and it goes to a full screen. So I want to make sure to hit those moments where we have picture in picture. We make sure to get Lady Gaga on there presented by the logos in there. Then let's do some close-ups of faces. Again, abstract, abstract. I want to give my client something that feels like fine art where it's like, it's not your normal style frame. It's kind of, it, it really comes from a different place, hopefully, and it comes from a place of doing abstract work in my spare time, and hopefully that translates to my personal, uh, to my professional work in such a way that clients call me for it, which is awesome because all this got accepted. The one that we thought that wouldn't get chosen was the spicy concept, and that got chosen, and then later on it got a little bit more uh, mild or medium, I, I think, in the final package with some of the glitches staying in their glitch world. They, they wanted it glitchy to begin with, but how do you do glitchy that's not standard glitchy. So I wanted to do like a tasteful new kind of glitchy. So I wanted to utilize the pixel sorting glitchy mixed with maybe larger abstract glitchy, like cubes and stuff and squares in that one. So yeah, that was a ball. That was a ball, man. That was a total blast. Dude, this one is so cool. I kind of, I just want to like stare at it. I, <laughs> I'd love to see these Thanks. Photoshop files. Are They're your, are your Photoshop files like a mess or They're are you, mess. are you organizing them for animation no, like for production not a, unless it gets unless it gets chosen and i need to send it to somebody i'll send it to somebody with a, a little bit more cleaned up um mm -hmm. but for the most part it needs to be like a painting i'm doing on my my table i need to have a happy accidents i really i need to turn on layers that were previously turned off that find me i mean it's really an exploration it really truly is and i love that exploratory that's when i get the lean in moments i was kind of mentioning is when you get those and you go, okay, well, if we're gonna use the type here in this one, let's not use it like that in the next one, let's go here for the next one, you know? We have too much neon green here, let's go dark. So contrast, contrast, contrast in, in the quilt is really how uh, a lot of these come to be. And I'm looking at some reference for how to apply type in a certain way. I love the repetition of some screen printers I was finding. Um, and uh, on that best album one in particular, I love those, like, let's just have it have it repeated in the background like six, uh, whatever, nine times there with a big glitchy uh, happy accident of a of a, a pixel sorted circle that I just randomly did to see what it would look like. And so you just knocked out a frame. So we're just already moving on to the next frame. We knocked one out. Let's move on to the next one. We just got, let's go even more abstract with this one. Let's go and actually hit what the client wants with this one. Needs to say premieres this date. We totally know we got to hit that. Um, but when when you don't have a ton of time on it, I you, I'd rather go blue. I'd rather go out there than than just give them exactly um, down the line backhand type of thing, you know. Thanks so much for checking out this episode. Make sure to look at Justin's work at KlausStudios.com, and you can find all the show notes for this episode at SchoolOfMotion.com. Thank you so much for tuning in.